hands could help love lifted me all my heart to him i give ever to him i'll cling in his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs faithful loving service to to him belongs love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me come forward we're going to have our prayers and our prayers are does it seem a little dark up here before we get to our prayers does it seem a little dark is that intentional does it normally like that i'm not trying to call anybody out but just, we got austin till praying oh thank you guys <laughs> and then um if we could have nate go first and then austin till or no is it mitch yeah i think it's mitch mitch and then austin till if you would guys Heavenly father just thank you so much for uh the opportunity to be able to meet in your house tonight, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much for the ministries that uh, part of our church are involved in across the world right now. We, we pray for the teams that are in Burkina Faso and uh, Pastor, as he's in Nepal, Lord, just uh, give your gu guiding hand of protection over them, Lord, while they're serving for you in the other countries. Um, you be with uh, us in the service tonight, Lord. You, you say if there's two or more gathered in your midst, Lord, that you're here. And uh, we claim that promise, and uh, we, we ask for you to give the wisdom to the speakers tonight and uh, just, just help everyone to be able to pull away what you have for them tonight, Lord. And we, again, we, we thank you so much for everything you've given to us, and we bless this night, Lord. Just I pray. Amen. Father, we thank you uh, for who you are. Uh, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy that you have so richly bestowed on us in Jesus Christ. We thank you uh, for blessing us in so many ways. Uh, we thank you for your blessing upon this church. We thank you that we can have uh, so many missionaries around the world serving you uh, and proclaiming your gospel. Uh, we thank you even from those uh, out from among us, uh, as Mitch just mentioned, that are on uh, short-term trips uh, serving you and uh, sharing your gospel in different capacities. And we thank you for all that you have allowed us to do here as well, Lord. Uh, even for the VBS this last week, we thank you for your blessing there, for uh, allowing us to get the gospel to so many kids here, even in our community. We thank you for the professions of faith that we saw as well, Lord. Uh, we ask that you would uh, bless our time this evening, that you would uh, bless the preaching of your word, and that you would prepare our hearts to hear it and to, uh, to take it in and to put it into practice, Lord, uh, that uh, it would uh, change our lives and uh, make us more and more like you. Uh, we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would stand and we'll shake some hands longer than five seconds. find your way back to your seats I did that because I got this weird like I said I always I always freak out like I'm, I'm gonna forget my notes or something like that or my my iPad's gonna like freeze up or something like that and so I just did that because Kelly printed off my second notes and so I had to wait till she got up here and so we put that up there and so please don't move that Stephen or anyone else um, but anyways welcome again to Neat this evening we'll be in second Kings pastor like I said is in Nepal and uh, uh, Trent is in with the teens, with Brother John and Miss Deemer and Miss Sandy. They're over there in Burkina Faso. So be in prayer for our guys. Jeff Bush is, is in Nepal with Pastor Miss Betty, and so is Jason King. And so is, I'm trying to think who else, the Elrods and all the missionaries over there. So be in prayer for our missionaries. Um, tonight I'm pretty excited. We get to go through Second Kings. Second Kings, and we're going to talk about um, passion. And um, 
somebody like was looking over my outline. I forget who it was, but I said, that's kind of, you know, ironic that you're going to be talking about passion and it being not enough. So I don't know why he gets that view or how they get that idea, but I think that um, we're going to learn some, something from the life of Jehu, how he was a zealous guy. He was a, a passionate guy, but zeal and passion can only go so far. It's not enough. And so we're going to talk about that today. But before we get into our message, uh, we're going to have a missionary report, right? We're going to have a missionary cabinet, and I think that's Alan Harris. Alan Harris is going to come up here, and he's going to talk, and then we're going to have our five-minute preacher, which is Austin Till. So listen. Hello? Okay. <laughs> so I represent the uh, continent of uh, North America, and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Republic of Cuba. And Cuba is located just south of Florida in the Caribbean. Uh, you can see it. it's right there in the center. Cuba is a communist nation. It was the first communist nation um, created in the Western Hemisphere. And Cuba is just about the size of Florida. But before we talk about it, I want to show a quick uh, video that It's not going to work. How about the external link? Okay. Uh, well, the video is going to give you a background on <coughs> the history of uh, Cuba and the relationship with the United States over the past 100 years. And I think that's important to understand. Uh, one thing that has happened to Cuba in the last two years is um, the previous President Obama opened up the doors for trade between the United States and Cuba. So the doors are now open to Cuba for anybody that would like to go. You would still need a passport and a visa if you travel to Cuba. Um, so Cuba has roughly 12 million people. The capital is Havana with just over 2 million people. And prior to Castro coming to power, 85% of the population was uh, considered Roman Catholic. But since then, 64% of the people now consider religion unimportant in their lives. Cuba has a very high literacy rate of 97%, and they have uh, consistently ranked in the top two countries for adult literacy since 1981. They live a healthy lifestyle. They, uh, men are expected to live 77 years, and females 81 years. They recognize the Cuban peso. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, Cuba is a communist government. It's made up of the National Assembly of People's Power. It's a 614-member assembly that chooses the 31 ministers and president of the country without any opposition. In a communist country, that's just the way it is. The people don't have any power to vote. Uh, the people of Cuba, as, is, as in any communist country, they are under suppression, maybe not as bad as North Korea, but they, it is still there. To give you an understanding of, uh, of what that's like to live in a communist country, um, a doctor is considered a high-paying job, but it only pays $50 a month. Any job that you have in the country of Cuba is paid out by the state. And the average monthly disposable salary after your tax is $25 a month. But the government will also supplement free education, subs subsidized medical care, housing, and some food. If you want to uh, buy beef, um, you're looking at $9 a pound. But somebody that makes $25 a month, you can see not many people wouldn't be able to eat beef. If you want to uh, access the internet, you want to log on and look at your Facebook page, that'll cost you $2 an hour. Basic utilities like your garbage, your water, um, run about $13.50 a month, which is a little more than half of your monthly income. So um, the door is open to Cuba. As in all communist nations, like I said before, uh, the people are under suppression. They don't have, you know, materialism, so to speak, like we do here. They don't have the freedom and liberty that we do. But what the people of Cuba really need is they need hope. They need the blessed hope. And they need only the liberty and freedom that you can find in Jesus Christ. Thank you. All right, well, I'd like to invite everyone to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 22. As Brother Robert just said, uh, 
Shortly, you'll be hearing a message from him about the story of Jehu, um, but I would like to bring you a message about uh, Josiah. Um, so if you would turn to 2 Kings chapter 22, um, his story is found in the 22nd and the 23rd chapter, so we'll be starting in verse 1 of chapter 22. Um, and what we see in this passage and this story about Josiah is that while most of the kings before Josiah, they did evil in the sight of the Lord, they weren't obedient to the Lord, uh, and all of the kings after him were the same, but Josiah, he was different. Let's see what God's word has to say about him. Uh, let's look at verse 2. It says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So Josiah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he pleased the Lord with his life. And I really like how in the first part of chapter 22 here, we can really see the character of this young King Josiah. He was only eight years old when he took the throne, um, but from a young age, he proved that he was actually wiser than many of the kings before him because he obeyed the Lord. He was different. He stands out in the book of Kings. We often read that such and such king did that what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The next king did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But we get to Josiah and we get this breath of fresh air. He did that what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was a man of character. And friends, how are we doing in this area? Are we men and women of character? Does character mark our lives? Are we striving to do what is right in the sight of the Lord? To not turn from the Lord to the right, neither to the left? Well, how can we tell the difference? How do we know if we're walking and doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord? Well, the passage continues to tell us about Josiah. Um, if you skip down uh, to verse 10, it says, And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And so leading up to verse 10, we have this story where Josiah, he sends a scribe, Shaphan, to the temple, to get some money to rebuild the temple. And he's talk, Shaphan, the scribe, is talking to the priest, Hilkiah, and he's asking for this money. And Hilkiah just kind of says in passing, he says, oh, by the way, I found the law of the Lord. I found the book of the law. It's almost like I was rummaging through the temple to find the money that the king asked for, and I just stumbled across a Bible. They forgot where they kept their Bibles in the nation of Judah. They had so long been living in disobedience to the Lord, they forgot where they put their Bibles. And I know that that's probably not true for most of us here tonight, but do you read your Bible? Do you love it? Do you delight in it? Do you strive to obey it and to do what it says? Let's not be like the nation of Judah. Let's be men and women of the Word of God. If you're not reading the Bible, let me encourage you to find it and to read it. And enjoy obeying it. So Shaphan the scribe, he's on this errand. Hilkiah finds a copy of the word of God, shows it to Shaphan. Shaphan's like, wow, this is amazing. He takes it back to the king. And when the king hears it, read in his presence, he tears his clothes and he repents before the Lord. He says, wow, our nation has been living in disobedience for so long. We didn't know. They had been living in disobedience for so long, they forgot the word of God. They forgot what the word of God said. Verse 11, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. He was humbled by God's word. He realized his sin, he realized the sin of the nation, and he wanted to repent. Then, in chapter 23, we see how he puts that repentance into action. We see how he tries to turn himself, and he turns the nation around uh, for the Lord. How does he make things right? Well, it says in chapter 23, uh, beginning verse 1, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. He said, okay, we've got to start over. We've got to reset things. Let's read the word of God in front of you so that you know what the Lord says, and let's make things right. So then in verse 3, he makes a covenant before the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that are written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. So after all this, 
Josiah starts putting the word of God into action. He commands the priests to cleanse the temple of all the idols that were in it. He tears down the high places that the kings before him had set up to other false gods. He slays the priests of the high places to the point of burning their bones on the altar. And then he does something amazing. He commands the people to keep the Passover according to the law. In chapter 23, verse 21, it says, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. He has them reinstate the Passover. It had been years since they had celebrated Passover. If you look at verse 22, it says, Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. From the time before Eli and Samuel, all the way into Josiah, they had not celebrated a Passover feast like this one. Why? Because they discovered the word of God and they delighted in it. And they thought, wow, this is the God that delivered us out of Egypt. Friends, do you delight in the word of God like this? Does it, just, does it not just encourage your heart to read it and to read what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and saving us? and redeeming us? I hope it does. All right, I'm going to pray, and then the men are going to come forward for the offering. I'm going to give you an update on uh, the Masters family, uh, Tyler and Gretchen, Nora, Judson, Yael, and Roman. All right, let's pray, and we'll take the offering. Heavenly Father, it's great to be in your house tonight. Thank you for your word that's already been proclaimed, the encouragement that it is to us. We as your people, we need your help, Lord. Uh, You don't love us less, Lord, when we don't come to church, but uh, it seems that when we miss spending time in your church and with your people, we seem to love you less. I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage our hearts to be focused on you. We do lift up the Master's family, their ministry now, their ministry overseas, uh, the family, uh, financial, uh, their, their ministry, everything, Lord. We just lift them up and praise you for what you're doing in Christ, and we pray, amen. So just by way of update, a lot of people here in our church, uh, thankfully we know a lot about missions, but we need to continue to learn. And something that I've learned about over the years is the different avenues that missionaries can get into different countries. I'm sure you've heard of the different ways. One of the ways is tourism. They can go in as a tourist, and they have certain months of how long they can stay in the country before they have to leave. They have to go out to another city and then renew a visa and then go back in. Or sometimes they can renew it within the city if there's a consulate nearby. All those different things. Other people can come in as students. Uh, Another thing, you know, okay, I'm going to be a student. I'm going to be registered at this college. I'm going to be learning. I can stay in there for six months or maybe a year. Uh, Another way to come in is a business. Okay, so I have a business in this country. Um, I'm going to go in to work in this business. And as I'm in the business, that's my inroad. So that's my visa. The next one might be just uh, an actual missionary, someone that says actual missionary on their visa. Other people might be uh, a religious person. My father in Indonesia, uh, for years he's been a a professor of theology. So all the different ways. But um, the Masters family, they've been there under a business visa, from my understanding. But here recently I've had a great opportunity to be able to sell that business and then focus wholly on the ministry. And I've talked to Tyler about this. didn't take a lot of time away from him to do this business, but it's still this kind of a juggle thing. Take your attention off this, and you have to focus on here and keep the books right and keep the business going and then go back and minister. But now he has an opportunity to be official pastor of a church in Tunisia. So that's just a wonderful, exciting opportunity that the masters will be able to be there and recognized by the government as a a pastor of a church. And he's able to sell that business, so he's praying for that to take place. There's a lot of things going on. Pray for that to take place. Pray for the business to sell and, and just rejoice about what God's doing. But also pray for the people that are still there in Tunisia, the young men leading the church, and then the the continual opposition that they face. They've also requested family uh, a prayer for the Sims family, and then also for Gretchen as she prepares for the Women Behind the Scenes conference here at her church. And then also they have a plans for a mini summit coming up in Boston. So continue to keep this family in your prayers, their ministry, their future plans, and then just continue to rejoice and praise the Lord for all that God's doing here. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us again. We'll sing together.
Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us His precious blood. Who His love will not remember, who can cease to sing His praise, He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the Mount of Crucifixion, Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Flowed a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above And heaven's peace and perfect justice Is the guilty world of thy fullness you are pouring thy great love on me anew without measure full and boundless drawing out my heart to you you alone will be my glory nothing in this world I see and sanctified me you alone have set me free my foes are many they rise against me but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My help is on the way. abounding my soul will rest in you I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way
Amen. Hope His grace still does amaze you. Um, just got a phone call. I was sitting up here and um, wanted to make sure it was anything important, so I had Jeff go take it and uh, come to find out it was a mom. The great thing about, you know, bringing the van route, you get new kids in, right? And you always, you know, get, they get to hear the gospel, but like, it's bad when you lose them, right? And so, <laughs> like someone said, I wonder when the, my son's coming home. I don't need to see Christian out there. And so he, she's, uh, uh, Jeff said, it's just uh, Christian's mom. He's wondering, she's wondering when he's going to come home. And like all of a sudden, Brother Jeff, my heart like literally dropped to the floor. I'm like, oh, junk, we lost Christian. Because the bus route has already been gone. I mean, like this has been hours, Brother Eric. I was like, what in the world's going on? I don't know what's happening here. But to come to find out there was another one, okay? It was a teenager. He's here at the church service. So don't worry about it. It's okay. And so I can breathe, and his grace still amazes me. <laughs> and I really do appreciate that. Because sometimes we're not always that lucky. But anyways, if you got your Bible, we're going to be Romans chapter 10. We'll start off right here. The Bible says, this is what Paul says. He says, brother, in my heart's desire and prayer for God, or to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record. Get this. That's right. Is that brother Sam right there? There you go. I only have never heard him say amen like that until I say something about a Buckeye. But anyways... <laughs> He says, I bear them record that they, get this, have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. These people are passionate, but not for the right thing. They don't know God. These people have a passion and a zeal. They're very religious, but not according to knowledge. Paul said about his own life in Philippians chapter 3, if you go there, just flip over, there should be a couple pages to your right couple books over there. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, he said this. He's talking about his, his testimony here in this passage. And he says, concerning zeal, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He says, you want to talk about a zealous guy, a passionate guy, a guy that's on fire? You want to talk about a guy that, you know, really, really outwardly shows like what he believes? You want to talk about that? You want to talk about zeal? You want to talk about passion? I did so, so much that I persecuted the church. In 2 second, in second Kings chapter 9, we're going to hear about the story of Jehu. And Jehu is a zealous, passionate man. The Bible says, and I think in 2 second, second Kings chapter 10, verses 15, he looks down to one of the guys, he says, come up here, see my zeal for the God. I think it's 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 16. He said, look at my zeal for God. Look how passionate I am for God. But passion's a good start, but it's not enough. Does that make sense? Passion's a good start, but it's not enough. Passion's not going to get us to heaven. Just because you're a religious person, just because you're really passionate about what you believe, just because you're passionate about things that you say that you hold to, doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven on that. And tonight we're going to look at the story of Jehu and see how God worked in Jehu's life and what Jehu did and we're going to see how God used them. But before we do that, let's say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I ask that you would just be with me as we go through the story of Jehu. Lord, I ask that you would just bless this time. Lord, help this scripture come alive to people. Help them see this story and not just be enamored with the story, but Lord, help them to see the truth that you're trying to teach us, Lord. That we can be passionate people, but, around the, but about the wrong things, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would increase our love for you. Make sure our motivations are right, Lord. If someone's here today and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, and they're just going through the religious motion, Lord, and they're passionate about it, Lord, but they've never really known you, Lord, I ask that you would save them. And Lord, for the person out here that's just so passionate on the outward expression, they're just such a good, um, what is the word, actor, Lord, I ask that you would just deal with their heart and help them to get a zeal and a love for you. Lord, I ask that you would work in our hearts, work in my heart, work in everyone's heart out here, work in our lives. I ask that you would change us, help us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Jehu, in the first part of 2 Kings chapter 9. If you guys got your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 9. Starting in verse 1, Elisha turns to one of the sons of the prophets and he tells him to take a box of oil and go down to Ramoth Gilead. And he was there, that, 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 that messenger was supposed to look for a man named Jehu. And then after he found out who Jehu was, then he was to take Jehu in a room, anoint his head with oil, and make him the next king of Israel. And this was all by the commandment of God. 
And then after he did that task, then he was supposed to open the door and run as fast as he could. Well, the young man went down to Ramoth Gilead, and he went to the places where the captains of the host... Now, get this, Jehu was a captain. He was like a general, okay? And so they're sitting around this big table, and they're probably playing poker or something like that. And they're talking with all the general buddies and stuff like that. And look in verse 5. This young man comes up to him. In verse 5, he says this. He says, And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting, and he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. I have an errand for you, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all of us? And he said, unto you, Jehu, unto you, O captain. I got a specific job. I got, I got something I got to talk to you about. I got, a, I got a message I got to give you. So they went outside the house, and as soon as the door was shut, the young man told Jehu this. Look in verse 6. He says this. He said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And this is your task, king. Next king. Verse 7. That you will smite, thou shalt smite the house of Ahab, thy masters. Why? Look what he says. That God may avenge the blood of his servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. He says, king, Je future new king, new king, Jehu, captain, I've got a new job for you. God's going to make you the king over Israel, and he's got a specific job and task for you. He wants you to go to the house of Ahab, and he wants you to kill everyone because God wants that done because God promised it, and he, for he foretold of it. Verse 8, he says, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that shut up up, Shut up and left in Israel. Verse 9, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the house of Bashan, the son of Ahijah. I'm not going to even try these words, okay? The dog shall eat Jezebel and the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And as soon as the young man was done telling that message, he ran away. You see, in the beginning of this passage, we see Jehu getting a job, getting a task, getting a position by God. And so what does Jehu do? He returns to his friends. One of them asks, hey, is everything all right? That's kind of weird. You know, some kid just runs in here. We're playing poker. What's going on? I don't know what's happening. He says, yeah, that's kind of, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind, of, kind of crazy. And Jehu basically just shrugged off. And Jehu's buddies responded, no, we don't. And Jehu told him what happened, that God had anointed him the new king over Israel. Now, the first thing we see in this story was Jehu was given a job by God. He was to become the next king of Israel. He was to take out, in essence, the trash. He was to wipe out all the house of Ahab. He was supposed to kill all the 70 sons that Ahab has. He's supposed to destroy the kings. He's supposed to, he's supposed to wipe out Ahab's line. He's supposed to take care of Jezebel. Because you guys remember the story how, Je how Ahab and Jezebel, they, they killed Naboth, got, uh, one of God's servants, one of the guys that feared God. You guys remember that? And God was heavy, taking vengeance. His word was coming true. And that was Jehu's task, to wipe out all the evil kings Ahab's fa family. Well, the next part of this story is, is not only did Jehu get the job, but he gets the job done. He just didn't get a job and a task from God, but we see in this story, it is the craziest story that you can ever notice. It's a, it's a, I, mean, I mean, we're talking about a guy that takes his horse and tramples on a woman. We talk about a guy that gathers all the Baal worshipers in Israel and says, come together, we're going to have this big, huge Baal party, and we're going to have fun, we're going to have an offering and all this stuff. And during that time, he goes up to each guy and he makes sure that they aren't worshipers of the true Lord. And during that time, he kills out all the Baal worshipers. Not only that, he tells Samaria, he, got, he tells the town of Samaria, he tells them, hey, you guys are holding 70 sons of Ahab. I want all their heads in a basket. He, tell, he sends them two letters. And you know what happens the next day? As soon as those guys, those, those elders of that town hear it, they, get, they find out Ahab's sons, they chop off their heads, and they send them off in a basket back to Jehu. We're talking about a guy, we're talking about a guy that, that, that he not only gets to kill, well, I don't, I don't want to ruin all the stories, but it's just so great. But anyways, we're talking about a guy that, has a, that, that, that goes after the king of Israel and kills him in his chariot. And then not only kill the king of Israel, then he goes after the king of Judah and destroys him. Man, this guy was passionate. He was on fire. He, I mean, he, God gave him a task, and it seemed like he did exactly what God wanted him to do. 
But the problem is, is this. Passion is not enough. It's not enough to be passionate about your religion. Because at the end of the story, we find out that Jehu walks away from God. At the end of the story, we find out that Jehu doesn't follow everything that God wants. So let's see what happens in this story. So, Jehu was given the job, he was given the task, not only to be the king, but to destroy Ahab's line, okay? So what does Jehu do? He devises a plan to kill, to kill the king of Israel, Joram. Now the king Joram, get this, in this story, I'm just giving you the, the, the quick overview, okay? The, the, the spark notes, okay? That's what we call it, spark notes. You don't have to read the whole thing. You guys can go back and read it for yourself, okay? The king of Jordan, he was, he was nestled down in a town called Jezreel. And he was staying there because he was recovering from his wounds that he received in fighting another king, the king of Syria. And while he was in that town of, of Jezreel recovering, his cousin Ahaziah, which was the king of Judah, came to visit him. What a coincidence, Daniel. He's out there recovering there from his wounds that he had in a battle with the king of Syria. His cousin comes up to meet him. And so Jehu decides that he wouldn't let the king leave town. So Jehu gets this, jumps in his chariot. He jumps in his chariot. If you don't know, if you don't believe it, uh, jump to uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 15. 2 Kings 9, 15, the Bible says this. So King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him. And when he had fought with Haziel, the king of Syria, and Jehu said, If it be in your minds, then let none of those guys go forth, and don't let them escape out of that city. So what does he do? Verse 20, he jumps in his chariot, he takes off in his chariot, and he rides towards where King Jehoram is. He rides toward Jezreel. He's going out there, and he's, he's flying. And while he was riding towards Jezreel, verse 17, the Bible says, there was a watchman that stood in the tower in Jezreel, even into, and he spied the company of Jehu. And as he came and he said, I see a company. And the king said, Jehor, Joram said, take a horse, a man, and send it to meet them. And let them say, is it peace? So as Jehu and his band of men are going out towards this town, because they're not going to let the king escape, the watchman goes up there and he sees what's going on. He says, man, I see a group of guys. They're coming after us. I don't know what's going on. And the king says, well, get yourself a guy that has a horse. Run out there and ask him if there's peace, if you come peaceably. So the king sends out, the watchman sends out the first runner. And the first runner's out there. He's riding as, as hard as he can. He gets out there and he says, hey, hey, is it peace? Is it peace? And as soon as Je uh, Jehu hears the, hears the words that the guy's saying, he says, what do you have to do with peace? What do you know about peace? Get behind me. And the guy listened to Jehu. He went behind him and he followed along in the big group. And the watchman looked out there and he says, King, the, the first guy that we sent out, he's not coming back. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? He said, well, send another guy out there. And so they sent out another guy. And the watchman sends out another guy. And the guy's running out there. And as soon as he gets close to Jehu, he's yelling. He says, is it peace? Is it peace? And Jehu responds, he says, what do you know about peace? Get behind me, turn back, and follow me. So that second guy goes out there, and by that third time, the watchman notices the guy was going crazy. He was riding his car, chariot really crazy, kind of like Pastor Gardner does, you know, in his car. But anyways, he just noticed, like, man, that guy's driving crazy. I think that's Jehu. I think that's Jehu in the army. And so the king jumps in his chariot, him and his, his buddy, his cousin, and they go out there to meet Jehu. And they say, hey, is it peace? Is it peace, Jehu? Look in verse 18. Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. That's what he said to the messenger. Verse 19, the second one. He said, Turn behind me. Verse 22, And it came to pass when Jehoram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Verse 22. This is where the king says it. He says, Jehu, is it peace? And he answered and he said, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Jehoram, or Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery. There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And as they were running away from Jehu, the Bible says, Jehu, look at verse 24, he drew his bow with full strength and he smote Jehoram between his arms and the arrow went out in his heart and, it sunk, and he sunk down into his chariot. This guy was a passionate man. As he was given a job, man, he got it done. People come out and say, hey, hey, are you coming peaceably? He's like, what do you know about peace? 
You guys are wicked people out there. You guys, you guys have gone after the whoredoms and after the, 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 the witchcrafts of Jezebel. What do you guys know about it? Man, he was passionate. He was zealous. He actually killed the king. And as soon as Ahaziah saw that J, uh, Jor Joram died, the, the king of Israel died, he takes off. Get this, Joram dies right there. You know where they meet up? In a little vineyard area, a little property owned by Naboth. Ain't that a coincidence? Ain't that a coincidence? The place where, where, where God said that his blood would be shed. Isn't that a coincidence that right there, that happens? Well, anyways, Jehu goes after Ahaziah, verse 27. But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled. By the way, verse 27 of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him, and he killed him. He smote him in the chariot, and they did also going up to Gur, which is by Abilam, and fled to Midgo, and he died there. Man, what a passionate guy. That's just two kings died in one chapter. That's pretty impressive, all by one man. Pretty impressive. Well, it doesn't stop right there. What Jehu does next is pretty, I think, is pretty grotesque. But he decides to go to the town of Jezreel. And as he goes into the town of Jezreel, somebody, some messenger, told Jezebel everything that happened. And so what does Jezebel do? I don't know why she does this, but the Bible says she paints her face and she pulls her hair back. She gets like dolled up, you know what I'm saying? And as soon as, as, as Jehu goes through the town, as soon as he goes through the town, as soon as he enters the gate, she yells at him and says, Is it peace with you, Zimri? Had Zimri peace? Is it peace with you who killed his masters? Man, what's some smack talk right there? Once a, I mean, this woman, this guy just killed two kings. She obviously knows that, you know, God has said that you're death worn out for you. This woman goes out there, has the audacity to paint her face up, pull her hair back, go out there and talk to God's messenger and says, is it, is it peace with you, Zimra? It was, it was an all underhand, uh, 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 she was talking smack. That's the best way I can say it. Because of what if a guy did in 1 Kings 16, you guys can look, look at that later and read that later. But as she says that, Jehu hears it, and he looks up, and he says, Hey, is there anybody on my side? Like two or three eunuchs, look out. And he says, Hey, throw her down. And they threw her down, and Jehu takes his horses, and they begin to trample on this woman until she's dead. Man, what a crazy guy. And you know what this guy does after he does this? He kills two kings, and then he kills a queen. You know what he does? He goes inside and gets himself something to eat. <laughs> That's exactly what the Bible says. He goes sit down and he gets something to eat. And he says, okay, guys, I think I'm full. Let's go out there and let's bury her. And when they go out there to bury her, guess what happened? All they found is her skull and the palms, just like God said, just like the Lord said. That's all they find. They can't bury, they can't bury Jezebel. Man, what a guy of passion. What a guy that's not, I mean, he's, he's just a different type of guy. Well, it doesn't stop there. Like I said, that evil king, remember the task that God gave him? He said, I'm going to be a king and I want you to wipe out the line of Ahab. I want you to take out Ahab. That evil king Ahab had 70 sons. He had 70 sons. And the way Jehu got rid of these guys was this. He wrote out two letters and he sent them to the town. And the people feared Jehu because of what he did for those two kings. So Jehu said, if you're with me, I want you to take the heads. I want you to take the heads. Look in 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 6. This is concerning Jehu. Then he wrote a letter the second time, and he said unto them, saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men of your master's son, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now the king's sons, being 70 persons, were with, uh, were with the great men of the city which brought them up. Look in verse 7. Look what these men do after they get the second letter. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, they took the king's son, they slew the 70 persons, and they put their head in a basket, and they sent them to Jezreel. Man. Talk about fulfilling what God's told them to do. Talk about, a, I mean, this is kind of graphic, right? I mean, trample a woman... You kill a guy with a bow, you kill a guy in a garden, 
Then you kill these guys by having their heads put in a basket. I mean, this is terrible, right? This is not something we want our kids to re- re- uh, listen to or watch, right? This is, just, this is a, a horrific, gory type thing. Man, he was, was kind of a little weird. He's kind of off. He's kind of like blood-driven, right? I mean, this is kind of weird, right? Well, it doesn't stop there. In verse 22 of 2 second, of Kings chapter 10, he said unto them, he said, Bring forth the vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And they brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab, and the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal. And he said unto them, and he said unto the worshipers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord. What happened just a couple, couple verses before was, Jehu sent out a, 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 a message or something like that throughout all the land. And he said, I want all the Baal worshipers to come here. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to have a, a big Baal worshiping party. And as he was in there with all those Baal worshipers, he's like, hey, guys, I want you guys to look out among yourselves. Make sure there's no worshipers of the Lord. And they did that. They, were, they looked out and made sure there's no worshipers of the Lord. And verse, verse, he said, I only want Baal worshipers only. In verse 24, and when they went in to offer the sacrifices, the burnt offerings, Jehu appointed four score men. Without, and he said, "If any men whom I have brought into the into your, uh, if any men whom I have brought into the men uh, your hands escape, he that letteth them go, his life shall be taken for the life of him." Guys, don't you dare let somebody outside these doors. If someone tries to escape, I'm taking your life. Be aware. That's what Jehu's saying. Verse 25, and it says this. And it came to pass as soon as he made the end of the offering, the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guards and the captains, "Go in, slay them." Let none come forth, and they smote them with the edge of the sword. And the guard and the captains cast them, and they went into the city of the house of Baal. Get this. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal, and they burned them. Verse 27. And they break down the images of Baal, and they break down the house of Baal, and they made it draught until this day. Verse 28. And Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Man, what a great guy, right? What a, what a guy on task. Man, he was even a self-proclaimed zealous man. In verse 15, or 16, verse 15 of chapter 10, and he was departed, he lighted on this guy. They were coming to meet him, they saluted him. He said, is, is thy heart right? As my heart is right with, my, with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, he says, it is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up in the chariot And this is what Jehu said. He said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Remember those verses that we just read at the beginning of the the message? Israel was zealous concerning God, but without knowledge, but not according to knowledge. Philippians chapter 3, verses 6, how Paul says, concerning zeal, man, my zeal was I persecuted the church. Man, zeal is a good thing, but it's not enough. Zeal is a good thing, but it's not enough because you see, at the end of Jehu's life, the Bible says this, verse 30, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because you have done well in executing that which was right in my eyes and hast done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children to the fourth generation shall sit on thy throne of Israel. Jehu, you've done everything I've asked you to do. You've kept the commandments I've told you to do. Good job. But verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Jehu did everything that God told him by the mouth of Elijah. Jehu destroyed all the house of the wicked of King Ahab. Jehu gathered all the people together for that huge Baal worship. And all the people that worshiped Baal, and it was like Jehu plotted it. And he destroyed all the Baal worshipers. You see, Jehu was a man on a mission. Jehu destroyed all that was wrong with Israel. Jehu was a man of passion and of zeal. But passion and zeal is not enough. Because he failed to walk in the law of the Lord God with all his heart. Jehu slew them all. 
He didn't leave one remnant out of the house of Ahab. Of Ahab. He took the Baal worshipers and he slew them. He broke down the house and he took all the images out of the land. Everywhere, fury, zeal, passion. Come look at my zeal is what he said. But passion is never enough. You see, today, today there's many Jehus that live today. They are the ones that have had great honor for their parents. And out of great respect to their religion that they got from their parents, these Jehus of today remembers his mother and their fathers. They remember the faith which they were reared in. They're loyal to the religion of their parents. Does that make sense? They're loyal to the religion of their parents. They're zealous because their parents followed after this religion. They live and they work and they go to church. They get this religion because maybe they were baptized. Maybe they said a prayer when they were younger, but they don't remember it. Maybe they're on the church roll, but they have no evidence of being a born-again Christian at all. Then there's another man that I see that's zealous in today. He's working. He's working in organizations to make the community better. He's working in all these efforts to clean up the town, to get rid of poverty. And away he works. And then I look at him and I see there's nothing of God at all in his heart. I look at him and I say, he's a good citizen. He's zealous for the things of his city, but there's no evidence of love for Jesus anywhere. Then there's people in ministry who are zealous for ministry. They're zealous for a thousand different activities that goes along with the prestige that comes with it. But there's no power, there's no drive of the Holy Spirit at all. Come and see my zeal for the Lord. But it's not of heaven and it's not in their soul. And I tell you why. Because Jehu was furious and he had an eagerness to carry out the mandate of God because... Why would he do that? Because the more members of the household of Ahab that he murdered, the more secure was his throne. When he had all of them dead, then Jehu had no rivals. And it pleased him to carry out those commandments. But his heart wasn't in it out of a love for God. You get that? There are a lot of Jehus today that, man, I'm passionate about doing something, obeying God's word. I, I, I obey his principles and I follow through on his principles. But they do so out of a zeal because it makes them better, not out of a love for God. And that's what Jehu's problem was. You see, passion's a good start, but it's never enough. Passion's a good start, but it's never enough. Their soul was not enamored with, love for, with a love for God. They had zeal, but not according to the Spirit, not according to love, not according to knowledge. That's why when I read these things in this book, oh God, oh God, what am I zealous for? What am I passionate about? What am I eager for? God, search my heart, see my heart. God, are we trying to build a great church for the glory of God, or are we trying to build a great church for the glory of us? God, are we trying to reach the world because they are lost and we love them, or do we seek them because we want to make such a great report? God, is our zeal and all the activities of our, of our church is because we're proud of our classes and our, and our organization, or is it because we have a love for you, Jesus, and a love for, your, for lost souls? What, what, what is it? What is it that passion? What's the motivating factor in our life? When we sing and when we preach, when we do the work, do we do it with no thought of ourselves and what it shall mean for us, or do we do it because we just love Jesus? Jehu was a furious man. And this man was zealous for God. He was passion. He was passionate. But passion is never enough. You see, Jehu had his reward, and it was for himself. It was for personal gain. His heart wasn't, give to Jesus. It wasn't given to Jesus. It wasn't given to the Lord. What about you? 
right now with everyone's heads bowed, everyone's eyes closed, I want you guys to ask yourself the question. This is a Saturday night crowd. This is the elite of Vision Baptist Church. These are the workers and Awanas and children's church and Sunday school teachers and board evangelism cabinet members and deacons and training center students and everyone else. Why do you do what you do? You can fool us with passion, but is it out of a love for Jesus? Do you do what you do because it's in your heart, because you love God? Or do you do what you do because you love the attention? Do you do what you do because, man, that's what mom and dad did. Today is a good time that we self-examine ourselves and wonder, why are we passionate? Why do we give so much money to missions? Because it's birthed in us? You sit in your seat, or you come up to this altar, and you, you have a time alone with God, and you ask yourselves, Lord, what am I passionate for? What's my motivating factor? What drives me? Don't be a Jehu. Don't be a Jehu, though, even though he gets the job done, he fails. Because he takes no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all of his heart. We'll have Stephen sing. Fast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. may be seated real quick. I'm going to give you a couple announcements. A couple announcements. If you are interested in uh, working with the WANAs, um, we're going to have a special meeting. Uh, Miss Whitney's going to have a special meeting. It's going to be a, a lunch um, sometime in the next few Sundays. And so if you're interested in working in Awanas, I want you to listen to this. If you're interested in working in Awanas, I want you to go meet Miss Whitney Elrod. Is Whitney here, right? She's in the nursery or something like that, probably. Okay, so she's in the nursery right now. She's watching the youngsters. So if you would like to help out in Awanas, please talk with Miss Whitney. Can we say that again? Can we say that together? If I want to work in Awanas, I'll talk with Whitney. Say that with me. If I want to work in Awanas, I'll talk with Whitney. Okay, so please do that if you would um, and sign up. Also, this Thursday night, um, Brother Tony is going to be preaching. Brother Tony is a great man of God. Um, he worked at this church from the time it was born until like 2012, 2013, and God has used him greatly. He's used him in my life. He's used him in my wife's life. He's just, he's just a great guy. So I ask that you guys would be here on Thursday night. You're, you're going to enjoy Brother Tony. I mean, he is, he's awesome. So I hope that you guys make plans to be here and make sure that you bring somebody. See if you can bring somebody. Um, those are the only two announcements I have. So if you would, please stand, and you are dismissed. God bless. Mm -hmm.